Premiers across the country are pushing back against the federal government for the planned carbon tax increase. And you'll hear this week uh, a federal government uh, talking about how in some magical way that this carbon tax is economically neutral. The carbon tax seems to be a stick approach where the carrot approach works much better. Carbon tax is the worst tax you could ever put on the backs of the people. Going up another $15, there needs to be a pause on, on this tax. You can't opt out of the Federation. You can't opt out of Canada. It's been a week. Federal provincial tensions escalating as the Liberals face pushback against their signature climate policy, promising to th set the stage for an even more focused push from the Conservatives when the House returns on Monday. All of this quickening the political pulse as that April 1st carbon tax increase looms. We're going to talk about that with our party insiders. Greg McEachern is a former Liberal ministerial staffer. Melanie Richet is a former communications director for the NDP. And Fred Delory, he is a former Conservative campaign manager. Uh, I don't know if you've written your letters uh, to the Prime Minister. Everyone's doing it this week, Fred, and, and that's where we're going to start because you want to highlight this. It's yeah. the Tories and the Premiers on the anti-carbon tax. Uh, yeah, campaign. it's it's and it's this is a break week. The House doesn't sit this week. This is usually the week uh, in the parliamentary calendar where the government gets to set the agenda in terms of the national news and what's talked about in politics. But Polyev and his team has been have been incredibly uh, uh, successful in dominating this week and lining it up for the April first. Uh, spike of the the carbon tax, and you know, Polly have started out earlier this week uh, with a rally in BC. He's gone across the country, he's in Atlanta, Canada, uh, this weekend, and he has just dominated this issue. And we're seeing now where he goes. There seems to be a, an effect where even liberal leaders. You so you showed a lot of conservative premiers mm -hmm. coming out. The Newfoundland uh, and Labrador liberal premier, the lone liberal premier in the country, came out uh, to call on a spike, uh, mm -hmm. to spike the hike. And then we had uh, the Nova Scotia liberal leader, and now the today the New Brunswick liberal leader has now called on it. Yeah. It's it's he's been incredibly successful at driving this message. He's out there full force campaigning it. And I know carbon tax is a you know it's one of those issues when the environment's a top issue, it's a losing issue for us. But when inflation is the top issue, it's a winning issue for us. Right. Uh, and that's worked very well. But what I find most interesting in this, the Liberals, the NDP and the Bloc Québécois are all pro-carbon tax. They're not out there communicating on why we need this. They're missing an action on this issue. Yeah, I, 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 I have said to Raj Pillai's liberal, right? Is he? Yes. yes. So, so, so the, the territorial is, premier, yeah, right? So I, no, we, I, I made this in trouble. No, no, I know, I know. Provincial <laughs> premier, right? Like, yeah, provincial no, no, premier. no. You're not wrong because I have said I have said this on the air, and I was corrected on it, and so I. I I'm here to inform as best I can. But, you know, Greg, uh, Fred's got a really good point. I, I mean, um, Polyev has been doing this. Where it got the juice, I think, was the, the provincial push really sort of compounding what Polyev did this week. And Fury's written a letter like this before, but he's never written a letter like this when Justin Trudeau was 15 mm. to 20 points behind and Scott Moe is refusing to pay the carbon tax. So the context has changed, even if the content has not, you know? And as Fred pointed out, the Conservative leader has been on a cross-country tour that included Newfoundland and Labrador, and he was just there. Um, and, you know, and he's been on the road a lot. His voice sounded pretty scratchy today, so <laughs> it might be time to get back to, to Ottawa. Um, I don't think the Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador's letter was particularly helpful for Liberal fortunes right now. Mm. Um, I spoke to a, a former, uh, long-time Newfoundland politician who said, the perception in Newfoundland and Labrador is that the Justin Trudeau government has been very good to the province. I think of Muskrat Falls and how they stepped in. I think it was over $5 billion. Yeah, great mitigation on that. So, you know, with friends like those, um, I'm not sure. I, I know Premier Fury a little bit um, through, through family. Um, I'm not sure his intention was to send a rocket, but that's... You know, that's what's happened here. His statement I find very odd because it's worded something like, you know, for it sounds as if I've been saying this for a long time, if it happens right now. That there's a phrasing around that that sounds a little bit odd. I don't think that was helpful. On the reverse side, back to what Fred said. If you can make this about the environment, I think that's where the Liberals need to go because we do not have a plan to compare it to from the Conservatives. We have what Pierre Polliver ran on in 21, which was some sort of weird, you contribute something to the government, the Conservative government would set up a bank account and tell you what you could spend on. 
all conservative MPs that ran in 2021 ran on that, but we don't have anything now to compare it on. Yeah. And, and I think about, you know, not to, to, to mix a message here, but we often hear what other countries think of us when it comes to our NATO spending. At some point about meeting our targets, we're going to hear from other countries as well. And we seem to only be able to tell one story at a time right now in Canada and then not completely. At that point, the focus may change a little bit and say, what is Canada going to do to meet our, our climate targets? Because right now we don't know what a Conservative government would do. No, we don't. And Mel, uh, I don't know if we're going to find out because, you know, it's five questions, no follow ups. And, and then the answer is on whatever the leader wants to say. And, you know, that's the tactic they have uh, chosen. As Fred points out, it's working for them politically. Mm. But like he wrote a letter to David Eby, the, mm. the premier of British Columbia, saying you shouldn't raise your tax either, which mm -hmm. is interesting given jurisdictional issues. Mm -hmm. And Eby said, you know, referred to it as a baloney factory in mm -hmm. terms of how uh, Polyev comes up with his policies. But nobody knows what the conservative plan is on carbon. But as Fred says, it doesn't matter because they're right. making it about cost. Right. Um, what's What I find interesting about this is the ability for the Conservatives to um, be disciplined on their message and um, outside of EV, really not having anybody on the other side fighting back, making it super clear what it is that's at stake, making it super clear what, what this tax does and doesn't do. And I think in the absence of that, and I would even go further and say opening the door with the carve out, with you know, supporting the conservative motion, other opposition parties supporting the conservative motion uh, to remove the carbon tax on some things, that just kind of makes Pyotr point, instead of having somebody out there saying, no, and here's how you're wrong. Um, so I think the, the disciplined approach from the conservative has turned this into something, and now we're hearing different provinces, of course, some of these provinces have already said this and have been saying this sure, for a while. Sure, they've been fighting it since day one. Totally, right? but the ability, it feels like, when you're hearing this conversation, the ability to say, hold on a sec, this isn't what you're talking about, um, seems to get further and further and further away. And it was nice to see um, Premier Eby today standing up and saying, taking him to task for it, because right. really, we haven't seen the Prime Minister do that, we haven't seen other opposition leaders do that. Well, well the Prime Minister kind of did it in Calgary the other day, right? You know, he, he gave a lot of answers on this and attacked uh, Conservative politicians, but right. he used the word short-sighted, and people apply that to the Premiers, and that caused pushback from the Premiers. But, you know, uh, Fred, as, as they try to like, come up with their counter-messages to this, the, the tactics just move on. So next week, we're going to go back into the House, right. and we're going to see votes on April 1st carbon tax pushed by the opposition. Yep. We're probably going to see Ken McDonald vote against his government right. again, and who knows who else might happen. So this is the wedge they just keep hammering in there, right? And that was the thing when the Prime Minister made his response today, or this week, it was a response. Mm. It wasn't him driving the message on why this is uh, important to, uh, to the economy or to the country. Right. Uh, and that's where they're missing an action on this, where Polyev has dominated. And next week, you're, it's two votes they're bringing. They have two yeah. opposition days, uh, and they're bringing it on both issues. So they're going to dominate next week on this issue as well. Yeah, and, and Greg, like this issue next week on a vote, and also the Palestine issue that the NDP are bringing on a vote, it's, it's, it's stuff that hits at the fault lines of, of a liberal politics right now. Yeah, I mean... The, the reality that I get a kind of a kick out of here is that, you know, the pressure on the prime minister to do something, to, to prevent this on April 1st, uh, in one breath, especially conservative commentators saying, you know, there's nothing else this government can do. But yes, we want the prime minister to do this so we can, you know, run around with the wind. And the prime minister was very strong and said, you know, um, he's not for turning on this. Mm -hmm. And I think that actually resonated really well with, you know, I would I would say the base of the Liberal Party, but also progressives who wanted to see this program. I mean, at some point, you know, perhaps we were distracted by a worldwide pandemic, but we lost <laughs> the plot on this of why we were doing this. And that was the government's job to continue to tell us why this was, you know, and, and there were, yeah, look, we had a couple of elections on the, where, where people could have sent a message to the government. And now it's been seized on very cleverly by premiers, by the conservative leader. But tell us what you're going to do, because we're going to have another season of wildfires and of hurricanes. Yeah. Trump, COVID, Ukraine, and now uh, affordability have all sort of like uh, de derailed uh you know, the, the larger agenda plan. Anyway, we'll see how they play it when the House comes back. Mel, uh, you wanted to highlight uh, a former mayor making a jump into provincial politics. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we saw Mayor Nenshi put his hat in the ring for um, the next leader for the Alberta NDP. Uh, like the guy, don't like the guy. People talked about it this week. People were paying attention. He came out and took swings, and he took swings that landed. He had, you know, the premier and the sitting government taking shots back. And, uh, you know, when something like that happens, people pay attention. Um, I think in the context of 
federal politics and and I think back of you know the inability or the hard time that you know uh, liberals other opposition parties have had to define Pierre Polyev and to take shots and have stuff that lands um, or the ability to come out and just do the thing in comparison to you know um, Mayor, or former Mayor, Mayor Ned she put his name forward and right away people are talking about the swings that he took and they're landing mm -hmm. uh, especially in this race um, where you haven't really seen that from the other contenders or their or their um, maybe taking a lighter approach about how they uh, go after the current sitting government. I thought that that was um, interesting, and and obviously I'm I don't have a, a horse in the race. I'm not mm. going to be voting for the next leader of the Alberta NDP, but um, that to me was interesting, and people pay attention to that sort of stuff. Yeah, but so so Fred, it kind of speaks to this point, right? That uh, he you know he he came out of the gate and said Daniel Smith's government is not only incompetent, they're immoral, like very clear, hard, pointed clips. And then when they started uh, talking to Rick Bell, who's on the show, he works for the Cal uh, the Post Media and the Calgary Paper. Um, saying that he's a target-rich opportunity, he just unloaded on Smith again. So already the narrative, at least from out this far away, is that it's Smith versus Nenshi because he's attacking her enforcement responses. Mm -hmm. So, look, may not agree with Nenshi's politics, mm -hmm. but I love that a guy like him, a person like him, is running for high office in this country. I think it's great to see these people step up who have great, you know, we, we see all these great politicians who disappear. They go into the mm -hmm. private sector. He, you know, he was mayor for three terms, I think, um, undefeated. Uh, to see him disappear from the political discourse is it would be unfortunate. So I think it's great to see people like him stepping up and going again and taking big swings. Uh, I think that's good. I think it's. Uh, I would love to see this across the board uh, on all sides of the political spectrum. I think it's good for for our politics that we have leaders like that doing this. Um, what I also find. Um, He's really solid. You know, he was not a new Democrat before mm -hmm. this. Uh, no. so, so I think it's great, though, that, you know, that we have a solid uh, two-party system developing in Alberta. I think it keeps the Conservatives honest, and I think that's going to be good there as well. And But, but also, it's interesting, the, all four Western provinces now have strong new Democratic parties. Yeah. Uh, two of them are in government, and two of them are, are close to being, or at least competitive. Uh, obviously, I hope my friend Danielle Smith crushes him in the next election, <laughs> but I think it's All really, of those nice things being said, I, I hope you great. fail. <laughs> yes, I think it's great that we have people like this stepping up and getting into the game. Yeah, where he is disappearing from is our Wednesday Power Rankings panel, because Ninji <laughs> was a part of that. But, you know, the, the, the two-party system that has evolved in it, that may be Rachel Notley's legacy as NDP leader, right? What they were able to accomplish there. Your thoughts on Ninji, and then we'll get to your pick. Yeah, I, I echo what uh, Fred said about having strong, for good, for strong democracy, to having a two-party system. But in the United States, part of the problem that the Democrats yeah. got into was that Obama ignored the states. They really starved them for cash. In Canada, when for some reason I'm looking at the tea leaves about the Liberal Party and, and the future, um, there's no provincial party west of uh, a viable Liberal provincial party west of Ontario. Yeah. So Liberals look to someone like Nenshi and say, okay, yeah, absolutely, for the reasons that Fred just said, good for democracy, but also we need to have maintain that we've got some progressive voices out there. Would Justin Trudeau be in the challenges that he's in right now if he had, if there was less of a conservative movement throughout the, th through the West? So yeah. I, I think that's something to watch as well. Yeah, look at the First Minister's meetings in 2016 versus now. It's a very mm -hmm. different uh, set, of, set of priorities. Okay, Greg, uh, you're under play of the week. What do you got for us? Yeah, the Fifth Estate long-running CBC investigative journalism show had a um, uh, documentary last week about uh, the murder of a Canadian citizen. Um, Herdic Sim Niger. And Indian agents. And one of the first panels we did, um, there was a bit of reaction. Mel smartly called it uh, last fall. And, and all of a sudden, it seemed like everyone, you know, in the rush to, because you were angry at Justin Trudeau, you were siding with India. So I encourage people who may have jumped into that rush to, to watch this. But there's a really interesting thing at the end where it repeats allegations that the conservative leadership had the involvement of Indian agents in terms of buying memberships to help tip the balance for one of the candidates. And I find it remarkable that that documentary's been out for about a week. And after all the heat and fury around this subject last fall, no one's talking about that this week. Mel, uh it is an interesting one, the role of India in, in domestic politics. Uh, also interesting that this documentary has been banned on YouTube mm -hmm. in India at the government's request, mm -hmm. citing national security or some other reason. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what's your take on this one? Yeah, this um, uh, has been an issue, you know, when I worked on, on the Hill, when I was still working for the NDP, is an issue that we obviously... Um, 
uh, paid close attention to, but also we didn't have the choice. We were always asked about it any time that um, those divisions um, uh, about India, Sikh, like that was something that Jigme was asked often and, and I think sometimes unfairly asked. Um, so the, the um, unbalanced or the uh, the fact that, you know, some people would talk about it and others weren't, um, that was something that Jigmeet has to kind of do that mm -hmm. delicate dance all the time. So when, um, you know, we see that sort of stuff and we see the behind the scenes stuff, we've talked about foreign, uh, foreign interference and how there may be some foreign interference from China. We saw New Democrats talk about, we need to expand that and talk about India because, you know, some of those conversations were happening about how that um, had to do with the last election as well, whether it affected, um, you know, uh, politicians here or whatnot. So I think the the lack of follow up on this, I think, to your point, is telling. Um, mm -hmm. But but I do think it's um, uh, it's it's scary. A Canadian was killed on Canadian soil. This yeah. is something we should all be taking super seriously. All politicians, uh, everybody across the board, um, should be taken seriously. And and I hope we don't see this continue to you know not take up space. Okay, I, I've only got about forty seconds left. Fred, your thoughts. Uh, look, I think the uh, the documentary by Fifth Estate was was obviously very interesting and, and put out a lot of stuff out there that we may not have known. Um, the fact, you know, Melanie's point that a Canadian was murdered on Canadian soil is an incredibly serious issue mm -hmm. and something that all parties should take serious and not necessarily jump to conclusions or try to score political points on, which I think mm -hmm. is something, you know. We definitely the, saw that. Yeah, it goes back to being uh, disciplined and focused and that's how you win, and, but don't just jump every, on everything you see. Yeah, no, that, that is a very good point. And uh, it's not that I don't want to talk about it. We're out of time. Now. The show is just going to end. Uh, I want to thank you all. Uh, Greg McKecker, Melanie Richet, Fred Delory. Thanks for being here every Friday. Appreciate it.